The Unitarian Society of Ridgewood was founded in 1896 and has, for over 100 years, been a beacon of liberal faith. Our congregation is a welcoming one, no matter your gender, sexual orientation, education, history, ethnicity, theology, race, or age, we celebrate the wholeness of you. Ours is a non-creedal faith that does not ask us to believe anything in particular about God or the meaning of existence. We are a diverse people, diverse in our beliefs. But there are some beliefs we share. We believe in the inherent worth and dignity of every person. We believe that we are all interconnected, that our past and our future are intertwined, and that my liberation and yours and everyone's is bound together. We believe that love and compassion are the foundation that can change the world. We also believe that it is possible to look deeply at our own lives with curiosity and with a vision of change and to grow. And you know, as well as I do, that sometimes growing hurts. That looking deeply at our lives can sometimes be painful. Today, I'm going to be very honest with my words. If you are a white person and what I say this morning feels hard or painful, please try to stay here with us to really listen, to sit in that discomfort. And to our members, friends, and others joining us who are people of color, I want to recognize that in many ways this morning, I am speaking largely to the white people in our congregation. If it feels comfortable and safe for you to stay with us this morning, please, please do. But of course, your safety and your comfort come first. If you are new to Unitarian Universalism and to the Unitarian Society of Ridgewood, I want to thank you for joining us this morning. You'll get a real sense of who we are and who we strive to be. If you want to know more, please don't hesitate to check out our denominational website, uua.org, or our congregational website at uuridgewood.org, or to email our office at 113cottage at gmail.com, and we'll put all of that into the chat for you. We would love to get to know you. I do have a couple of announcements this morning. Today, the Spiritual Development Circle will have its initial meeting. If you are interested in music, art, Sunday services, lifespan education, this is the circle for you, and we would love to see you there. I'll provide an explanation of how to join that room at the end of the service. Also, just a reminder, as always, to pay attention to your emails. This is the last day to send in your photos for the virtual barbecue next week. Also, the deadline is coming up to sign up for the conversation on the book Salsa, Soul, and Spirit, Leadership for a Multicultural Age. And then this one's really important. Next Sunday, we have our annual meeting, and we need y'all to be there so we can have a quorum and make some important decisions about our congregation's future. If you are not getting emails from us, please, please contact the office so you can be reminded of all of those announcements throughout this coming week. In hard times, it soothes the soul to see beloved faces. Thank you for being with us this morning. It is good to be with you. Unitarian Universalism is diverse in its theology, and there is diversity in the symbols that hold meaning for us. One symbol we share is our flaming chalice. Developed as a symbol of the Unitarian Service Committee as it helped to rescue folks in peril during World War II, the chalice has long stood for hope in challenging times. It remains for us a solid reminder of our strength and our values in moments of injustice and uncertainty. If you have a chalice at home, we invite you to light yours as we light ours. Please join in the words that will be on your screen. We light this chalice for the light of truth, the warmth of love, and the energy of action as we gather together in the circle of community. This little light of mine, I'm 
gonna let it shine this little light of mine i'm gonna let it shine this little light of mine i'm gonna let it shine let it shine let it shine let it shine. Please take a deep breath. Come into this time together. A time for reflection, for questions and for honesty, for silence and for song. A time to hold joy and sorrow, fear and hope, pain and celebration. Take a deep breath and just be here right now. Listen to our centering sound. It calls us home to this community. It calls us home to ourselves. Be still, breathe, and listen. Bright morning stars rising, bright morning stars rising, bright morning stars are rising, days are breaking. This morning dawned bright and beautiful where I am. The sun is strong, the winds are blustery, the world is fresh and gorgeous. Through generosity and the privileges of birth, I sit beside the ocean this morning, its vast expanse of blue laid out before me. And I find myself reminded of just how big the world is just how small I am, how small my circle is. And this morning I contemplate how problematic that is. The contrast between the beauty of the natural world and the horrors of what humans are capable of doing to those we view as other is striking. We must change if there is to be justice. There can be no other. Differences there can be, yes, differences to be celebrated, but an other placed apart as if it were unknowable or lesser than, no. The circle must widen, our circles must widen. Our circles of care and compassion, of love and justice must widen to encompass not only in words, but indeed all of humanity this whole world over. Our circle must be as vast as the ocean and the limitless sky, and every being in it must be seen for their inherent beauty. For a new morning to dawn, for bright stars to rise, we must answer the call to change, to change our minds, our hearts, and our souls. We gather this morning determined to create a wider circle so that a world of justice and love might dawn. Welcome.
Please join us in singing our hymn, Circle Around for Freedom. We ask for an offering to support the work of this congregation. As Martin Luther King echoed, and as today we reverberate, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. John Saxon writes, our community is like a river formed from the many streams of our lives that meet and merge and flow to the sea. We share the streams of our individual lives to create a river that is both deep and broad, a river that is made of many streams, sustains life, and refreshes the land through which it flows. We know that in this moment, there are among us those who are unable to financially support the congregation and instead find themselves in need of support. If that is you, please let us help. Reach out to Reverend Sarah or the caring teams. For those of us who can give, please keep doing so with the mission of this place in mind. Your gifts are truly appreciated. We will now receive and gratefully accept the offering that streams this community and its work into the world. In 1963, Bob Dylan wrote this song, The Times They Are A-Changin'. He sang a couple of songs from his album of the same name at the March on Washington in August of 1963. You could absolutely say that the words to this song are just as relevant today, if not more relevant, literally today, than they even were in 1963. If you know this, please sing along with Peter and me. Please join me in our time for meditation, reflection, and prayer. Find as comfortable a position for your body as you can. Relax your shoulders and unclench your jaw. Let your hands and fingers rest loosely. Mindfully allow your body to come to stillness and rest and breathe deeply, slowly, in through your nose and out through your mouth. Breathe deeply and slowly. When I breathe in, I breathe in peace when I breathe out. I breathe out love when I breathe in. I breathe in peace when I breathe out. I breathe out love when I breathe in. I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I breathe out love. Spirit of life and love, <coughs> great wonder, force of righteous anger and bone deep sorrow, fill us and surround us in this moment. We come together in these troubled times, aware of our failings and limitations, seeking answers and comfort, wondering about what may come. Our hearts are heavy with many things this morning. We come with awareness that we are still in the middle of a pandemic one that continues to steal the lives of loved ones, friends, family, all across the world. We come with grief for the many losses. We come with fear that the numbers will rise. We come reminding each other to be as vigilant as we can in protecting each other. Alone, a raging pandemic would be hard enough to carry. Take a deep breath. When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I 
breathe out love. We come with anxiety over the state of our government as it continues to abuse power and limit the voices of the people, as it threatens democracy. We come with worry about the election this fall. We come with fear over the changes it will take generations to undo. We come reminding each other that we need not passively accept what is being done. Alone, a fear for the future of our nation would be hard enough to carry. Take a deep breath. When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I breathe out love. We come with anger and sorrow over the treatment of people of color in our country. As black and brown bodies continue to be treated as expendable, as justice takes too long to be served, if it ever is, we come with grief for the lives lost. We come with anger at a system that for centuries has oppressed and killed. We come reminding each other that we are part of that system and must confront our own role and work for something different. Alone, anger and grief at the treatment of our human siblings would be hard enough to carry. Take a deep breath. Breathe in, breathe out, breathe in. We come this morning with so many things on our hearts. Those we share with each other and with millions across the globe and those that are our own. The personal sorrows, the individual joys, the fears and the hopes, the struggle to get up and get through each day. Whatever you come with, whatever your heart holds today, alone that would be hard enough to carry. And so we come, reminding each other that we are not alone. We are not alone. Take a deep breath. When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I breathe out love. You are not alone. Know this in your bones with each breath you take. Each breath, a symbol of life, of shared living as the air moves through us all in turn. Each breath is a reminder that we are not alone. Breathe in peace and breathe out love. Commit yourself to creating a world in which it is safe for all of us to breathe. When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I breathe out love. So may it be. If not now, tell me when, if not now, tell me when, we may never see this moment or place and time again, if not now, if not now, tell me when. I've been thinking in music a lot this week. I don't know if that ever happens to any of you. Sometimes it is quieter inside my own head. Sometimes prose and poetry pop up. 
and sometimes it's music. There's a deep power in music. And the song that Kristen just sang a part of, If Not Now, by Carrie Newcomer, has been on my mind. We are in a moment, a place in time, as a nation, that we may, hopefully, never see again. But it is, sadly, one that we have seen far too many times before. Over and over in my lifetime, I have turned on the news or opened a paper to hear of yet another black or brown life being stolen. To list the names from the last 40 years would take a sermon or more. Even just the last few weeks, we have witnessed the murders of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd. And y'all, those are just the murders that have made national television. There certainly have been other killings of our black and brown siblings. And yet still, still I will hear people say, oh, that was necessary force, or oh, that was one bad apple, or oh, that was vigilantes. We can no longer accept, if ever we did, that, we, that these events are just one-off moments of rogue officers or accidental deaths. We live in a system that oppresses black and brown lives and bodies and does this with intention and with the weight of history. We live in a system that accomplishes this oppression through nearly every institution we have. And just one of those is our militarized police forces. Police brutality is the number four killer of black men in America. Let that sink in for a minute. And really, this should come as no surprise to any of us who have learned a bit about American history. Baked into the earliest laws of this country were the ideals of equality and liberty, but they were restricted. Slavery was sanctioned, and for centuries it was legal to murder and rape enslaved people, to separate them from their families. It was legal to use every form of torture our American ancestors could imagine. Legally, enslaved peoples weren't human to the masters and the lawmakers and the governments of our early nation. And even once a war was fought and freedom was theoretically granted, our white forebears found every way they could to keep black and brown lives in a perpetual state of struggle. They instituted laws of segregation. They made it hard for people of color to borrow money, own homes, create generational wealth to be passed on. Those who ruled this country, whether elected to office or through their control of money and power, worked to keep those freed from slavery in a different kind of slavery by preventing access to education and wealth and decision-making, health care, everything that makes it possible to feel safe and secure. They also worked to ensure that non-elite whites felt superior to people of color so that racially based hatred and fear would prevent any kind of solidarity among those in poverty and without power. And on top of everything, they instituted police forces designed to protect the status quo. In other words, to protect white people and to police and contain people of color by creating a school to prison pipeline that results in one in four black men being imprisoned in his lifetime. For centuries, our story as a nation has been a story of power and wealth hoarding by white people who have kept people of color outside the circle of institutional care and compassion, outside the circle of decision making. Layered over that shameful history is an even more shameful one. Through lynching, cross-burning, police brutality, and violent racism, our nation has enacted continued violence on the bodies of people of color long after freedom was made law. If you listen to me preach often, you know I don't usually use the words sin or evil, but I honestly have no other words for this. Our Unitarian Universalism believes in the goodness of people. We don't believe in the original sin of the Garden of Eden, but I absolutely believe that our original sin here in this country, here in this American experiment, is the racism that was built into our systems from the minute enslaved people stolen from their homes were forced off boats and onto this shore 400 years ago. The evils of slavery and racism live in us to this day. 
Some of us live with the privilege of white skin that allows us to benefit from these systems, while others of us live with black and brown skin that makes us targets and makes our lives worth less to America in 2020. We have to start with that truth. We live in a racist system. I see sorrow and trouble in this land. I see sorrow and trouble in this land. Although there will be struggle, we'll make the change we can. If not now, if not now, tell me when. So often when I have said that, that we live in a racist system, especially when I say it in liberal and white spaces, including Unitarian Universalist spaces, the response tends to be, but I'm not racist. I marched in the 60s. My best friend is black. I don't see color or any number of other responses designed to assure me and anyone else who is listening that this person is not themselves a racist. So I wanna be crystal clear this morning, and I'll say it again, we live in a racist system. Whether or not you or I personally hold racist views or values or enact behaviors designed to harm people of color, we live in a racist system and we cannot escape that. So yes, not every police officer is bad, but the structure and development of our police forces has been steeped in racism for centuries. As a result, these killings keep happening year after year. We have inherited modes of being, values, societal norms, and hierarchies of power that are themselves racist. For we who are white, seeing that is hard because the system is our system, designed by us and for us. A fish doesn't know that it's swimming in water, it just swims. That has been us, us white folks, for way too long. We've kept our eyes shut to the water we swim in. At times, perhaps that's been due to ignorance, many other times due to willful indifference. The time has long since passed that we have to open up our eyes. Even if it is hard or confusing or guilt inducing or shame producing, we have to open our eyes, especially us white liberal folks whose values really are equality and liberty and justice for every being. We live in a land of trouble and sorrow and we white folk have largely been privileged enough to keep it at bay, escaping hard conversations with ourselves and with our children, but the cost and God, the cost, the cost has been countless lives. Parents, siblings, children, generations of lives stolen or altered forever. Generations unable to breathe. I understand, please know that I do, how it feels to look in the mirror and have to say to yourself, you are part of a racist system. I know what it feels like to look inside and ask myself, what racist views did I grow up with uninterrogated and do I still hold them somewhere deep inside? I know the feelings of shame and guilt and sorrow. I know what it feels like to look at this country and think, shit, racism is so deeply embedded in everything. How do we ever change it? And I know what it is to feel embarrassed by messing up saying the wrong things or embodying racist behaviors, trying to take charge of things that aren't mine to take charge of. I know what it is to feel called out because I've made a mistake that harmed a person of color. None of it feels good. I know that. I know it personally. But and here's the thing that really matters. My discomfort pales in comparison to my deep belief that the systemic oppression of people of color is evil. What is my shame or discomfort compared to the need for liberty and justice and safety and freedom for people of color? And so what am I willing to do for the change we so desperately need? That is the question we white folks need to be asking ourselves. 
If we can recognize our system is broken and that we benefit from that brokenness, what are we willing to do with those privileges to help create a new system? Are we willing to use them to make change? Are we willing to give them up? And when? When are we willing to do it? What will it take? If this moment right now hasn't set you running to find a book to read to better understand white supremacist culture and our racist system, if this moment hasn't sent you out protesting, if this moment hasn't caused you to donate to Black-led liberation organizations, if this moment hasn't caused you to question our nation's founding and our rampant militarization of our society and our unchecked capitalism, if this moment hasn't moved you, what will? It's a real question. What will it take? If not now, Tell me when, if not now, tell me when. We may never see this moment or place in time again. If not now, if not now, tell me when. I may never see the promised land. I may never see the promised land. And yet we'll take the journey and we'll walk it hand in hand. If not now, if not now, tell me when. Right now, I know you know every day in this country and across the world, protesters have been out marching on the streets, chanting Black Lives Matter, chanting no justice, no peace. People have been out marching for George Floyd, Philando Castile, Eric Garner, Michael Brown, and so many others. People have been marching with demands to defund the police and to reform the prison system. People have been protesting to demand that we as a nation take a good, hard look at our baked in racism and to demand that we find another way. People have been out there marching in spite of a global pandemic that is already disproportionately affecting communities of color because there have been generations of disproportionate access to healthcare and food and education. People have been marching following liberation movement leaders of color and following youth. People have kept protesting despite police brutality wielded against them as they march to end police brutality. People have kept protesting, even though white supremacists have attempted to subvert these events by inciting violence. And people have protested using violence themselves. And I do not say the following lightly. I will offer no judgment and no condemnation for the use of violence by protesters. Again, I don't say that lightly. But expecting peace and nonviolence in the face of endless oppression that is itself violent feels to me like one more act of oppression. I'm not pro-violence, but I will not demand that our siblings of color and their allies who are fighting for justice be gentle when my ancestors and our current system have been anything but. I believe to my core that we white folks would be out there burning everything down if it were our children being murdered in the street. Why would we judge others for doing the same? And why aren't we out there helping in even greater numbers? Our white privilege makes it impossible for us to even fathom what this would feel like. So we have no room to judge. Even one of our nation's most vocal proponents of nonviolent protest, Martin Luther King Jr. said, riots are the language of the unheard. There are things we still haven't heard, things we still need to hear if we are ever going to make change. And change has been so slow. And yet people have been protesting day after day after day, even though they know this nation has been glacial in its progress on systemic racism. People keep protesting, even at the risk of losing their lives. More than once, I have heard a rousing sermon preached on justice. And often, if it comes out of a Judeo-Christian context, the language of the promised land is used. 
and you've likely heard this yourselves. The story in the Hebrew scriptures is complicated. The Israelites have been led from slavery by Moses and they are free. They wander the desert for 40 years looking for the land their God has promised them, and they find it, but it's inhabited. But God promises to help them clear it. That's a story for another day. And then Moses dies just before they make their way there. Despite all his hard work, he isn't able to see the promised land. The story is used as a reminder that we may never see the fruits of our own labors for justice. We might protest and march and even lay down our lives and we may never experience the freedom and liberation and justice ourselves. I've thought a lot about that story as I've watched the news this week. I thought about the hope and the courage and the desperation and the frustration and the commitment and compassion it takes to risk yourself knowing that you do so not because you will necessarily reap benefits, but because it's the right thing to do. Because generations that come after you will come to know peace and love and safety because of your work. I've been thinking about what it means to be part of the fight for justice. What is the work that is required to get to the promised land? Who needs to do that work? If not now, tell me when. If not now, tell me when. We may never see this moment or place and time again. If not now, if not now, tell me when. We'll work it till it's done, every daughter every son every soul that ever longed for something better something brighter we all need to do that work but the work is going to look different for each of us and it's going to take many forms the promised land will only be reached when enough of us come to understand how desperately needed change is and when we're willing to do what is required for that change to occur. We white folks have our own particular work to do. Our first step ever and always is acknowledging the truth of racism in our homes, in our towns, acknowledging the true lived experience of our siblings of color, and acknowledging that we simply cannot ever know what it means to be black in America. We white folks have work to do educating ourselves and each other about the racist history of our nation. We have work to do dismantling the racist behaviors and values and entitlements we embody unexamined. We have to help each other move through the shame and the guilt and into deeper understanding. And we have to do this without asking people of color to be our guides. We have to round each other up, check in on each other and call each other out make sure that we are always moving toward racial justice. We white folks have to use the privilege our skin affords, and we have to risk those privileges for the sake of justice. That might mean protesting, though in these times of the pandemic, it might not. It might mean turning more of our personal resources, be they financial or skill set resources, to the fight for liberation. It might mean advocating more vocally and robustly. It might mean finding ways to use the privilege of our white voices and bodies to give power over to leaders of color in the liberation movement. It is the reality that we white folks, even those of us who like to be in charge and in leadership positions, need to learn to sit down, take a back seat. We need to follow the leadership of people of color who've been working for those treasured ideals of liberty and justice for generations. Our white leadership hasn't exactly resulted in a just society. So we need to learn to listen, to let go of our expectations and privileges and follow. We can't go on as we have been. Things must change. And it will take a change of heart for this to mend. 
It will take a change of heart for this to mend. But miracles do happen, every shining now and then. If not now, if not now, tell me when. If not now, tell me when. If not now, tell me when. We may never see this moment or place in time again. If not now, if not now, tell me when. I don't actually believe that we can convince everyone in this nation that racism is bad, or that people of color are of equal worth and dignity. For all that I have stressed systemic racism this morning, the truth is that all over this nation are white supremacists and neo-Nazis and nice liberal folks next door who are racist. I don't actually believe that we'll change the values and the hearts and the minds of every person in this country. For sure, I would love for that to happen, but I don't think it will. But it also isn't strictly necessary. The change can come even if the far fringe of racists never change their minds. The change can come if all of us nice liberal white folks would recognize that it isn't enough to be nice liberal white folks. And I hold myself as accountable as anyone on this. I am as complicit as any of us. It's easy to preach and talk and educate myself and you and congratulate myself for doing just the beginning of this work. But it isn't enough. We need me to change and you to change. We need our village to change. We need everyone we know who truly does value human equality, who truly does believe in the inherent worth and dignity of every person, no matter their color. We need all of our hearts to change in concrete and actual ways. We need to start prioritizing the fight for justice and equality as we never have before, prioritizing it over wealth and safety. We need to start making actively being anti-racist a central goal of our own lives and our community's lives. Disrupting racism wherever we can and building into our behaviors and systems an attention to dismantling our racist system. We need to start marshalling our resources and our privileges to further this cause. And we need to believe that it matters not only on Sunday mornings after weeks of unrest and protest, but every single day. I know the feeling of hopelessness, of wondering what comes next and what to do. So I'm not going to leave you without some thoughts on that. We have a racial justice team at the Unitarian Society of Ridgewood. Email them, check out their reading list on our website, find out what they've been up to, bring your passion and your ideas to them, get involved with them. If you are white, find a white allies accountability group. I have one with colleagues. We can ask each other questions there, share confusion or moments of failure or success on our anti-racist journeys, and we can do it without re-traumatizing our beloved colleagues of color. If you wanna start a white accountability group, come and talk to me and I will help you. If you're white, start conversations among your white family and friends stop letting racist comments slide ask yourself all the time if what is happening around you or if the words being spoken to or by you have a grounding in racism stand up for what you believe in even if it comes at a cost listen to the upcoming series let's talk about race from ridgewood walks ridgewood talks Reverend Mac Brandon will be online for the next five or six Monday evenings, talking about race and chatting with others about this moment and where we go from here, what we as a village of Ridgewood can do. We will send out info on those sessions, but make time these coming Monday nights. Fund organizations that are working for change. The NAACP, Black Lives of UU, National Bailout, Black Lives Matter, any number of other organizations. I promise we will provide a whole list in the upcoming week of places where you can send money to help those who are protesting right now 
and who help the movement for justice going forward. Vote and do it with changes to our racist system in the forefront of your mind. And if it's safe for your body to do so, protest. Join the marches and the demonstrations. I promise you that I will do everything I can to help us move forward as individuals, as a congregation, and in our larger community. We need to be part of the miracle of change that must come. Whether we will see the promised land or not, whatever sacrifice it takes, we have to be part of building something better. Miracles do happen every shining now and then. If not now, if not now, tell me when. If not now, if not now, tell me when. I know things are hard right now. Things have been hard for generations. But you are not alone. We are not alone. Take a deep breath. Together we can widen the circle. We can work for freedom and justice and we can be part of the miracle of love. So may it be. Please join in the words for extinguishing the chalice. They'll be on your screen. We extinguish the flame, but may the light of truth the warmth of love and the energy of action burn bright in our hearts until we are together again. I want to thank you all for being with us this morning. I want to recognize that these are hard conversations and that we will continue to have them. Please reach out if you want to keep talking about this. We'll also provide some structured way to do that in the weeks to come. Um, but don't, don't hold it in. Come and, come and talk to me, okay? Thank you for being here.